Hi again. There's something else I need to say this week. A parallel message of sorts about another topic that I have been writing about a lot. Mental health continues to be on a lot of our minds as rates of depression, anxiety, suicide continue to go up. Record level suicide rates in our country across all age groups, not just in Utah. There's a lot of attention being given to mental health and attempts to raise awareness about mental health. Many calls for more conversation, more attention, more awareness. And that's great. There's far less attention, however, to the kind of conversation we ought to be having, or even different options in how to think about mental health, or who ought to be shaping the conversation we're having. What are the different assumptions we agree to accept, to take for granted as foundational starting points for the conversation? Surprisingly little attention being paid to any of that. All the details of how the conversation is set up. I think that's a problem. Especially because there's a lot about how a conversation gets set up that influences what we end up deciding and talking about or not talking about. And uh, from where I sit and from my vantage point, some of the most important conversations we could be having are not happening within the current terms of our public conversation. When I started my dissertation on depression, I was motivated because of the widely varied stories I kept hearing. Prozac saved my life. Prozac led to my son's suicide. And I couldn't help but want to dig into that a little bit. What is going on to lead people facing a similar difficult condition to arrive at such widely disparate conclusions? So over a couple of years, I interviewed people in Utah and Illinois who were facing severe depression. And I spent hours with them trying to unpack what was going on. What, tell me about this and that, and how about this? And just in as much detail as I could hear their full experience from beginning to that moment and what they saw looking forward, what they anticipated. Coming away from that, <clears throat> I ended up writing close to 600 pages just on those interviews. There was one thing <clears throat> that stood out more than almost any other. What stood out to me the most was that across all the very different diverse experiences of depression, this very real physical condition that was excruciating for people. There was also something else going on with how they talked about the depression. There was a kind of additional burden that people seemed to carry based on this story that was fairly common to many people I interviewed about what they were facing. <clears throat> And it went something like this. What I'm facing is connected to a fairly permanent deficiency in my brain. And that means I have a fairly lifelong condition that I'm facing. And I have a need for pretty much a lifelong management and treatment strategy. Now, for sure, <clears throat> the first time people hear that what they're facing has a biological connection 
can be relieving. <sighs> I know it's real. It's not just in my mind. It's something that I can put a label on and call something. And there is a relief that comes initially. But there's also a sort of despair that was very apparent in people as they settled into this new reality. And I, I would argue as they settled into this new narrative about reality, that this is, I, I, I'm a different kind of person. And my brain is a different kind of brain. And my life is, is from what I'm hearing, going to be a different kind of life. Now, I, I'm not trying to make light at all of any of this. This is deadly serious. I'm trying to share in simple form the big takeaway from my research was this other layer of burden that appeared to be resting on some of the people I interviewed. <clears throat> a burden of uh, a way of understanding what they were experiencing that felt from an objective place despairing. And so I got curious, like, where is this coming from? How, how does this story arise? How is it adopted? Who introduces it first? And what is that moment like? And that's some of what I've been writing. Let me give you uh, an example of some, some of the kinds of things people told me. One woman told me that her brain didn't have the chemical that she needed to be happy and content. Another person told me that <clears throat> exercise didn't matter for her because she had a chemical deficiency. And many people over the course of hundreds of interviews I've done now have told me that they were told by someone that what they were facing was going to be lifelong. And they tell it to me, not with any sense of curiosity or uncertainty. It's just like, yeah, this is what I am facing now. If the science confirmed this story, if the best research out there confirmed that, in fact, depression is associated with a permanent biological deficiency or disorder, we should be telling people that. If the best research told us that depression just had a lifelong trajectory of, of prognosis, that the natural course of depression was to last throughout a life, then we should be telling people that. And if there was clear evidence that a lifelong course of treatment was really the best hope that people have of finding some relief from depression, we should be telling people that. However, in all three of those cases, you cannot look at the full research literature and conclude that it supports those three conclusions. So why are we telling people this? This is an honest question. Why? <clears throat> what has led us as a society to deliver this story to people who are already weighed down by so much pain? A story that by many measures <clears throat> can exacerbate and multiply the pain. One woman I interviewed in 2011 <clears throat> told me this. And she had faced depression and really painful mental and emotional distress in her life. She said, when you are already feeling hopeless and in despair, to have someone tell you that what you have is a condition you're going to have to live with the rest of your life, it makes you feel even more hopeless, more in despair, more worthless, and like, why even try? 
Why even try? The pain is just going to last forever. Dan Iosefescu, a doctor at Mount Sinai Hospital who runs the Mood and Anxiety Disorders program, he, he states, in the midst of profound depression, many patients start feeling that not only is their current situation unbearable, but that it will continue forever. Now listen to this. He then continues, this seems to be the difference in why some people with depression decide to kill themselves. That's why I can't help but talk about this and plead with the many others who are advocates for mental health to at least consider the possibility that this awful, painful thing called depression might be worsened considerably by telling people that it is a lifelong thing that they just have to accept. I believe the current mental health conversation we're having in America weighs on people without them even realizing it. Stories are not just something that we tell. They're something that we live. We live them out. So let me ask you, what does this dominant story about mental health that I've been reviewing, what does that mean for people as they live it out? Is it leading them in a direction of lasting healing? Is it increasing hope and helping them ward off despair? You, you be the judge for yourself as you look at all the people in your life facing serious mental health issues. What story are they carrying around and how is it playing out in their life? That's the conversation that I think could be really helpful. Because as soon as we bring even a little attention to the kinds of assumptions and understandings that we're carrying around, all of a sudden we have a, a choice in which assumption we want to adopt and identify with and live out. No such choice exists for people who don't have that awareness. I've seen and heard many examples, as have you, of people carrying the awful weight of mental illness. Most of the time, they think about that burden as arising almost entirely from their body, their brain. I am suggesting today that a part of the burden they are carrying is that very story that convinces them their brain is the reason for why they're hurting. And by the way, that that brain has a permanent deficiency that will require lifelong management in an experience that they need to accept as lifelong. That story, that belief weighs on people. And I don't mean just an existential angst. I mean daily carrying it. I've shared on multiple occasions my experience interviewing a young woman who told me that her suicidal thoughts started the same day her doctor told her that her depression would likely be lifelong. Now I know that that doctor was not sharing that in an attempt to make things worse. Of course, he understood what he was sharing as reflecting the likely prognosis of what she was facing. Let's have a conversation about different perspectives on the prognosis of depression and different ways of thinking about the biology and different ways of understanding treatment and both its short-term and long-term effects. My work over the last 10 years 
has focused a lot on introducing another story about what's going on. And I can tell you from hundreds of conversations and many, many presentations that I've seen an immediate increase in hope that can come. Let me tell you what happens when someone hears that there is a possibility that their brain could move in another direction and that the problem that they've experienced may be more workable than they thought and could over time move in the direction of more lasting healing. I have had this conversation uh, hundreds of times since my dissertation. Hope comes alive for people. Not some naive hope that I can just choose to be well. I can just choose to be happy. No, this is, this is a process over time. It's staying open to the possibility of moving in a direction of more lasting healing and not just accepting that this is something I just have to accept that I have forever and, uh, and manage forever. One woman in Chicago told me that her family had been informed by the doctor that she would never live independently in her life. And she said that that had such an effect on her family. They couldn't imagine the possibility of her ever being well again. You know, I was conducting the interview from her own apartment that she was very proud to be in her own place. And she told me, never predict the recovery of another person. Don't, don't condemn them to a certain prognosis and neither should we fill them with naive hope that this will go away in X amount of time. We can't say, so can we leave it open? Can we allow people to explore possibilities and let people know that there is at least some hope of real lasting recovery from even severe mental emotional conditions. I know many people who were diagnosed with some of the most severe conditions like schizophrenia and have gone on to lead productive lives uh, of real healing and they describe themselves as healed. If that's true for schizophrenia, what about depression and bipolar disorder and OCD and anxiety and eating disorders? Can we give people a little bit more hope that that lasting, sustainable healing is possible. One woman, when I told about neuroplasticity, her immediate response was, that means I can do something. Whereas the belief in a permanent biological deficiency can almost paralyze people to the point where they're unsure w whether anything I do can make a difference. The understanding of brain changeability can lead people in the other direction to say, wow, okay, so what is there in my life that I can move in another direction that might, over time, make a difference for this, this horrific and painful thing I'm facing? And all the risk factor literature I've reviewed suggests that if you start to make changes in different life areas over time, not only can your vulnerability to depression decrease, but the very biological contributors to depression can also start to be unsettled. <clears throat> that brain can continue to change. And uh, even modern genetics researchers now know that genes can turn on and off depending on what we do. So there is all sorts of optimism that can be found. Not a naive optimism, not a sort of just go look at the sun and choose to be happy. No, I don't really believe um, that that belief is as prevalent as we think. Uh, the resistance that exists to the current conversation about mental health, I would argue, 
is connected a lot to this story <clears throat> that some of us look at and say, now that story itself feels a little depressing. Let's have a less depressing conversation about depression. Let's tell people a less depressing message about what they're facing. Recently, we published an article calling for a broader conversation about mental health in our country. And in that, we go through several different questions that we could be talking about. Most people I know who face serious mental and emotional challenges, and most of their family members are simply not aware of some of the profound disagreements. There are fundamental disagreements that exist in the research and professional communities. Well, let's talk about them. <clears throat> let's, let's help those who are grappling with and navigating these things be aware of them so that they can make their own choice on what they believe and what they want to do. In the absence of that kind of open conversation, we are effectively closing down people's choice because they're never even aware they had a choice. No one can look at the research on our prevailing treatment models. I believe no one can honestly look at that and conclude it's settled. And, and now we know for sure what we ought to do. We can put behind us any controversy or, or concern and just move forward and help more people accept this. That is not an honest conversation about what's going on. It just is not. And it either reflects a lack of time to be aware of and read of other perspectives, or a kind of ideological stance that says, I already know from my own practice or my own experience the truth and the only thing I ought to do is help more people receive it. <clears throat> if that's you, I'm pushing you a little bit to say, can we broaden that conversation even just slightly to include the reality that many other different professionals and researchers have arrived at a different place than where you sit? And can we explore together taking for granted that we're all well-intentioned, we're all doing the best we can with what we know. Can we come together and agree to explore all the ideas on the table? What could a broader conversation about mental health mean for the many people facing these problems? Really, could this bigger conversation make a difference for them? I think so. And maybe you're sitting there going, I, I think that bigger conversation would be harmful. I think, I think it would be unsettling and disturbing to people who have already accepted that this is what they need to do and this is how they need to be okay. And let me be clear, I'm not saying these conditions are not biological. Everything we do, we do in a body. The body is involved in everything. What I'm saying is that there are many different ways of thinking about the biology and inc including one way of thinking that is very despairing and painful if you believe that. What if we could peel back that story of a permanent deficiency and start to experiment with another story? It starts to get exciting. That's a hopeful message, right? I hope you'll see that the message I'm sharing is an optimistic one. That if it's true that the way we're talking about mental health is having a profound impact on not just the immediate moment for people, but how their experience plays out over time, then what would it mean to try out other ways of thinking other ways of talking about it and play those out. I can tell you 
what happens when I introduce people to another conversation and just start to touch on another story of a changeable brain and even severe problems that are workable and the possibility, even just the possibility of more lasting freedom and healing and recovery from the hell that people are facing. I have never once not shared that in a presentation or with a family that I'm working with and not had people come up to me and say, I have never heard this before. And it feels so refreshing. It feels exciting. It feels like something I'd like to try. Those who are facing these serious mental and emotional conditions are hardly aware that they even do have a choice. And they're hearing strong messages that this is the way you are going to find relief. And their only choice is whether to accept that way or not. It's whether to be compliant or not. That makes me sad because there, there are many other different possible ways to work with even severe depression and anxiety, delusional thoughts, difficulty paying attention. There are lots of different possibilities that are not being considered in our conversation. And I think that needs to change. I think we can change that without doing any uh, violence to the existing approach. If what you are doing and believing is working for you and leading you to the kind of life that you want, great. You continue on that path. I'm talking to the people who are barely hanging on on the same path. I'm looking for a little, a little possibility that there's something else out there. There is. <laughs> if that's you, I, I say, along with everyone else, keep hanging on. And know that there are many different ways of working with mental and emotional suffering. And there are many reasons to be hopeful that no matter what you've experienced so far, the, the brain, the body, the emotional state you currently feel can move in another direction. There is far more optimism available. There are other ways to think about these challenges and other ways to work with them. And I can almost guarantee you have not exhausted those possibilities. One woman told me that there is a big difference between some hope and no hope. Hold on to that some hope. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying we should be naive. Can we hold on to even a possibility of more profound healing or more sustainable recovery? What if you start to make certain changes in your life and adjustments that move your brain, your body, your emotional state in a new and a better direction over time? There's every reason to be hopeful. There really is. Imagine for a moment that you had two groups of people who are facing comparable levels of depression. Let's say a hundred people in each group and all other factors in their life are fairly equal. And the only difference between the two groups is what they come to believe about the depression. So in the first group, they have come to believe those three things we talked about earlier, okay? This is coming from a fairly permanent condition in my body or my brain. This will be with me likely for the rest of my life, but I can manage and uh, cope with this through the right treatment throughout my life. 
Now compare that with the other groups where they also know that there are biological contributors to what they're facing. However, for them, they understand that there's a, there's a possibility that biology can change over time depending on what I do. And in a similar way, uh, I, may not, I may not need to face this uh, for the rest of my life. There, there, there is such a thing as fundamental healing, which may allow me to not have to be managing it constantly. So that's the, that's the story the second group has. Now, move those two groups into the future and play them out. Look at the details of what, what they go on to face and experience. And you tell me which group does better. Which of these two groups finds the greatest relief over time? Which group finds greater healing over time? Which group does best in terms of their overall wellness and their ability to withstand the despair that can overcome. Stories are not just something we tell. They are something that we live. That's why I'm passionate about talking about them. Because if we can actually be aware that on top of our experience, we are all carrying a certain story about that experience. We're all carrying a certain interpretation about what we're going through. Then all of a sudden we have a little wiggle room and we might just be able to peel off a story that's not working for us and, and experience directly what is happening and then decide what beliefs, what understandings feel right and true to me? What, what are you convinced is the accurate story and the story that's going to best serve you and those we love around us? This is worth talking about. There's so much to talk about. We have so little awareness of the story and the language that we're putting on top of these conditions. We're, we're talking so little about that. And that is really my central plea today, that we start doing that more. Start comparing different ways we might talk about a condition and understand how how they play out in people's experiences. Let me be more specific. Please do not tell people who are already struggling with intense mental emotional distress that that distress will be lifelong. Please stop. Also stop telling people that Brain science has shown that this is a permanent deficiency in the brain. The brain science has shown the opposite. I'm emotional about this for the same reason that anyone else is emotional. These are real lives and beautiful people. And if we cannot spend the time and energy to think more carefully about the kinds of things we're telling people, then I don't know. Some days I wish I could put on a name tag and go door to door and just share this good news with people. There is far more hope than people are being told. Do no harm. That is a promise, an ethical promise that physicians have to make. Let's all follow it. I believe that if we brought more of this attention to the conversation we're having. If we had a conversation about our conversation, it could make a lot of difference for the people who are facing these problems, precisely because it opens up other options and possibilities. And some of those possibilities may be life-changing for people, but even just to have the possibilities alone 
is relieving and can bring real hope for people as they seek the healing that they so desperately want. That's really what this is about. And that's why I feel so strongly about this. So thanks for listening. And uh, that's all.